Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of On Attachment. In today's episode, we are talking about signs that an avoidant partner is deactivating and what to do about it. So to be honest, I usually steer clear of episodes like this to the extent that they feel alarmist or that they are going to feed the part of anxiously attached people that likes to play detective and that spirals into a bit of an anxious panic when they notice that something's wrong. I try not to do too much content that is directed at that, but avoidant deactivation is a very real thing. There's plenty to support the deactivating strategies of avoidant partners as part of that attachment style. And I'm sure anecdotally that if you are more anxious or you have otherwise been in relationship with an avoidant partner, you probably know that, yes, it is very real, this pattern of deactivation. And much of the time, I think anxiously attached people respond to that kind of in the way that I was just describing and in a way that can probably exacerbate the deactivation and the disconnection rather than help it. And so I'm hoping that in today's episode, I can lay out a few signs that an avoidant partner might be deactivating, give a little context for what that means and what that might signal in terms of what's going on under the hood for them. And most importantly, what you can do about it and how you can support yourself rather than, I think the the maybe more clickbaity version of this would be how to get them back or how to stop them from deactivating. I'm not going to focus as much on that because I don't think that that's helpful. Again, I think that feeds the part of you that believes that controlling their behavior is the only way to create safety for yourself. So instead, I'm going to give you some things that you can and should do both to advocate for your needs and yourself, but also support your well-being if you notice that your partner is pulling away, is deactivating in a way that is very triggering for you. And it almost always will be triggering to be in relationship with someone who is more avoidant and who is displaying these signs of deactivation. And I think also it's important to say that the anxiety that you feel when the person you're dating or in a relationship with starts to withdraw and pull away And that's not because you're just too anxious or too sensitive. I think that's a very understandable trigger for anxiety. And I think we can acknowledge that anxiously attached people tend to experience that to extreme degrees and tend to respond from that place of very high anxiety. And as I said, that can make things worse rather than better for everyone involved. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Before I dive into that, a final reminder about my Sydney workshop, which is happening next weekend. So if there are any last minute people who are around in Sydney next weekend and want to come to a two day workshop, definitely check it out. Would love to see you there. Also wanted to share that I am going to be running some promotions for Black Friday. I will mostly share that on my email list, but I'll be discounting a bunch of my programs and other things. So jump on my email list if you're not already, as I'll be sharing about those things there, including my homecoming mastermind, which if you've been around a while, you might remember me sharing about it last year. This is my most advanced level small group program that I've run twice before. I took a little break to be pregnant and have a baby, and I'm going to be starting it again early next year. And I will be opening applications in time for Black Friday uh, with a promotion there for anyone who's interested. This is a five month small group program. It's the most intimate way to work with me. And I'm really looking forward to running that very special program again. So if you are someone who has wondered about working directly with me in close quarters, homecoming is a really beautiful opportunity to do that. And I would love for you to check that out and receive your application. And as I said, there'll be a special super early bird Black Friday discount situation. So long story short, jump on my email list to stay in the loop about all of those things and potentially take advantage of those discounts that I'll be running. Okay. Let's talk about avoidant attachment deactivating strategies. So 
Let's just describe what that is for starters. So much like the anxiously attached person has their activating strategies, the things that they do when their attachment system gets fired up and is feeling stress or insecurity, all of the things that anxiously attached people do to try and close the gap, to try and get closer to their partner, to try and reestablish a sense of control, the avoidantly attached person has their deactivating strategies, which are essentially in the other direction. They're things that they do to try and create safety for themselves, but that usually means, you know, switching off their attachment system or deactivating from their attachment system because that's what safety looks and feels like for them. So when an avoidant person starts to deactivate, it's not a sign that they have lost interest or that they don't have feelings for you anymore or that you've done something wrong. It's just a sign that their system is perceiving some sort of threat or danger related to the attachment related to that intimacy, related to the vulnerability. Uh, And depending on the individual, some avoidant attached folks will have some sort of awareness around this. Others might be totally oblivious and they might, as far as their conscious awareness goes, just feel like they've lost interest. They might feel like they are not interested in the relationship. They might really convince themselves that actually it's just not the right relationship. Whereas at a more subconscious level, it's because these fears are coming up and all of the things that are hard for them about relationships have kind of tainted their view of the dynamic of you, if you're on the other side of it, and up prompting them to pull away in these ways to create safety for themselves. So it really depends on the individual, whether they are, I suppose, aware of the fact that these are deactivating strategies, whether they're aware of their avoidant patterns. And as I said, depending on the individual, some, some will be, some won't be. People with very strong dismissive patterns might be more oblivious to this and are likely not receptive to being told about it. Uh, you know, I always get questions from people saying, should you tell an avoidant person that they're avoidant? And I think if you're doing that to try and get them to see the error of their ways, so to speak, that generally won't play very well for you. So all of that to say that if you're on the receiving end of any of these behaviors that I'm about to share, and particularly if you have more anxious attachment, it's really easy to take these very personally. And it probably gets at your worthiness wound in a pretty direct and painful way, because obviously so much of your sense of safety comes from approval seeking and feeling connected and this sense of like love will conquer all. And you've probably attached very strongly to this person with a lot of hope and optimism only to have them start to pull away. Uh, And most anxious people will then go, what did I do wrong and how can I fix it? And that can of course trigger a whole cascade of anxious behaviors and so on and so forth. So just at the outset, wanting to emphasize that these patterns will likely follow someone with avoidant attachment through all of their relationships. In other words, it's not just you. These patterns will likely follow them through all of their relationships until they turn towards them and understand what's going on from there, confront their fears around intimacy and engulfment and loss of independence and all of those other things. So I I just wanted to emphasize that so that you don't, you know, panic and think that you've done something wrong necessarily if you're in relationship with someone who's displaying these behaviors. Okay. So with all of that being said, let's talk about what some of these avoidant deactivating strategies might look like. So first and foremost, increased emotional distance or generally being a bit emotionally withdrawn, being shorter in their responses to you, not wanting to talk as much. And when you do talk, maybe they give kind of closed answers and you feel like you're really having to draw blood from a stone to get them to even tell you how their day was or something really simple and straightforward. This sense of them kind of closing down and being quite cloistered uh, and you feeling like you can't really reach them even if they're there, that can be coupled with less frequency of contact. So them maybe being less responsive to texts and calls and other things. Maybe you're feeling like the pace of your communication has changed. Maybe they're harder to get a hold of and maybe they're not initiating any contact with you. If you are earlier in the relationship and you're dating, maybe they've stopped asking when they get to see you, all of those sorts of things. So there's this overall sense of distance that becomes very apparent. And that's both in terms of like physical 
distance and, and emotional distance in terms of how connected you feel to them. Another sign of deactivation might be reduced physical or verbal affection. So they might have been more physically affectionate previously and now they're not. I remember in a previous relationship with an avoidant partner, something as simple as like we'd be in the car and I'd place my hand on his leg and he'd lift my hand up and put it back on my lap, right? And inside I was like, who would do that? And why would he do that? And what's the problem? And he wasn't angry or anything. It wasn't a conflict. It was just such a, an instinctive pushing away. Uh, so things like that, you might be walking and go to hold their hand and they push your hand away or things like that, you know, that they're wanting to create distance and they are pushing away any sense of connection, even if it's something that's just a really simple gesture of affection. And similarly, verbal affection. A lot of avoidant people aren't particularly, you know, forthcoming with like words of affirmation and stuff to begin with, uh, but you might notice that really drop off. And I'll always hear from people because of course, anxious people tend to be real detectives about like differences in texting style. And they might say, you know, he always used to include emojis or like a kiss or an XX at the end of a text. And he was totally stopped doing that. So the tone has become a lot less warm and affectionate in our communication. So that might be another sign of deactivation. Okay. Another sign of deactivation might be that they are increasingly focused on independence and they might be really emphasizing in the things that they talk about that, oh, they won't be able to do that because they're, they've got this thing on that you're not invited to, and they're going away with their friends or all of a sudden they're really very clearly communicating to you that they have their own independent life and they, they seem to be very protective about that in quite a direct way and in a way that doesn't involve you. So it's almost like they're trying to remind you that they are their own person and that stuff is not yours to be a part of. Now, that might sound really harsh and it can feel harsh. Again, I've been on the receiving end of this, but it is just coming from a place of feeling smothered and feeling scared and overwhelmed. Uh, and they're almost like staking their claim on their life and their way of doing things and their friends and their work and all of these things that they want to really clearly demarcate so as to avoid those things becoming engulfed or becoming subsumed into the relationship in a way that feels unsafe for them. So you might notice that they are being more direct and overt about trying to protect parts of their independence or parts of their life that are really theirs and not yours jointly. Another sort of related sign of deactivation might be really resisting talking about the future or suddenly becoming a bit flaky or non-committal about future plans, even things that previously you'd talked about. So maybe you talked about, oh, next year we could go on a trip to Europe. And they'd seemed really excited about that. But now when you bring up like, hey, maybe we should plan that trip, they start coming up with an excuse or they're very vague and they are no longer excited about that. They don't want to talk about it. They sort of brush it off or downplay it or dismiss it. So all of a sudden they've gone from maybe being more open to talking about the future to now not wanting to engage in any sort of future discussion and really shutting that down or saying things like, oh, I don't know what my plans will be next year and things that can seem quite hurtful if previously you know, you've talked about doing something together or similarly, this could be things like moving in together or other things like moving the relationship forward. Uh, they might've previously been open to talking about it. And then all of a sudden they are really cagey about it and non-committal and they don't want to engage in any sort of conversation. And obviously that shift can be quite disconcerting if you're on the other side of it. And a final sign of deactivation, I should have said at the start, this is far from being an exhaustive list. These are just just some examples, is a partner being very critical or nitpicky of you, almost seeming like they feel disdain towards you or even like disgust. And again, that feels really harsh to say, but I think sometimes avoidant partners can feel almost repulsed by their partner. Like if you've ever heard the term of getting the ick about someone, I think avoidant partners actually get that a lot more than anxious partners do. They suddenly feel turned off by their partner. They kind of latch onto one insignificant thing or a couple of insignificant things and experience this 
repulsion or loss of attraction and they can become very critical and very judgmental of their partner. They might start judging you for things that you do that are different to them, again, from this place of protecting their way, protecting their view of things, protecting what is normal for them. And they might be a bit critical of your way of doing things or the ways in which you're different. All of those things, again, are just ways to create distance and maybe ways to either pick a fight or to interrupt the connection or even to convince themselves that the relationship is not right because doing that would shield them from the vulnerability of moving forward with the relationship. So having that sense that all of a sudden your partner's being kind of unfairly critical of you, judgmental, nitpicking, all of those things can be a sign of their attachment system firing up and and those deactivating strategies in full force. So that, of course, brings me to how to approach being on the receiving end of all of this. And as always, I think it's important to distinguish between different levels of commitment. So if all of this is happening a month into seeing someone, my advice is not going to be the same as if you've been with someone for two years and they're deactivating because there's simply a a different level of commitment, a different level of emotional safety, a different level of expectation, different level of investment. How willing are you to stick around and kind of fight for a relationship, that's going to be a a very different inquiry and and reflection if you've gone on six dates with someone versus if you've been, you know, in a relationship and you live together, of course. And I should say these deactivations, these can happen in an established relationship. It's not exclusive to the early stages, although uh, you'll probably quite reliably encounter it in the early stages of a relationship. So I think if you are in the early stages of a relationship, it's important, and I know this is easier said than done, to try not to panic again, try not to make it about you and something that you've done. As I said, I can almost assure you that whether it was you or someone else, like these patterns will follow them. And so it's it's not just you. It's not a problem with you. You didn't do something wrong in all likelihood, although it's possible that your anxious attachment has triggered their deactivating strategies and vice versa. That's part of the nature of it is that whether you realize it or not, you pick up on each other's attachment styles uh, and that tends to activate things within each of you that can feel scary, threatening, overwhelming, stressful. And then that if you don't have the awareness, which is why it's so important to have the awareness, you can then go into all of your default strategies for creating safety for yourself, which for the anxious person is ramping up and for the avoidant person is ramping down or pulling away. So remind yourself, it's not personal. This is just what they do. And at the same time, so compassion and taking good care of yourself through that is very important. Not taking it personally, as hard as that is to do. But at the same time, we don't want our compassion for them. And again, this is something that I see anxiously attached people do all the time is having so much compassion for them that you start making excuses for them, right? And you start tiptoeing around the behavior because you've read 10 books about it and that they're just doing their deactivating thing. And if I can just bend over backwards to cater to their needs in this difficult time, then maybe we'll get through it and maybe they'll love me again and they'll see how patient and understanding I am and whatever. That is losing yourself, right? Because it's really important to recognize that in all of this, like you're there too, and you do have needs and recognizing, yes, don't take it personally. And It is okay to be affected by this and it's okay to advocate for yourself and be clear about what you can tolerate and what you can't tolerate. And if someone's being rude to you, if they're all of a sudden being very flaky and noncommittal, you don't have to just stick that out. You don't have to just be fine with that because it's part of their insecurity. If anything, I think being really clear in what your boundaries and your limits and your expectations are and communicating those, not from a place of desperation and please, you can't do this to me. You can't, it's not fair. And last week you were being this and now what's wrong? What did I do? If you're coming at it from a panicked place, you will just reinforce to them that all of the things they fear about relationships, well, this person's too intense. This person's too much. This person's too needy. I knew it. I do need to retreat back to safety. If you can communicate 
you know, what you're able to tolerate, what's acceptable to you, what isn't, what you need, what you're looking for. If you can communicate that from a really grounded place that is genuinely self-advocating in the sense that like, I am okay to let this relationship go if we want different things. And that's really the ticket. And I know that's hard because it might not feel true for anxiously attached people. Oftentimes you're not willing to let the relationship go. And that's really where you start the self-abandonment process, right? You want the relationship itself more than you care about being able to feel safe in it. And so you hold on for dear life, even if and when it's so clearly not going to work for you in that form. So you've really got to get to that place and it might be a matter of faking it till you make it get to that place where you can say if you are not able to show up in this way if you're not able to be consistent and reliable and if you're kind of blocking me out of your life then that's not going to work for me and that's okay but maybe we just want different things and being able to kind of stand firmly planted in that self-advocacy is really important and I would argue is much more likely to get them to actually engage and is more likely to shake them out of their funk than if you chase them or if you cower and turn yourself into a tiny little mouse so as to not trigger them more. Either of those strategies is likely to reinforce all of their stuff in a way that will drive them further away. So get really clear around like where your limits are, what you can tolerate, what the relationship would need to look like in order for it to work for you, and then go forth and confidently advocate. And as I said, that might be a little bit of faking it till you make it, and that's okay. It's not about being a dictator. It's not about telling them what they can and can't do and how dare they and getting really righteous and indignant. It's just about going, what do I need? And can I communicate that from a place of, here's what I'm looking for. And if that's what you're also looking for, then great. Let's continue walking down this path with some clear guidelines and frameworks on how we're going to do things and how we're not going to do things in order that we can both feel safe and respected. But if that's not what you want, and I'm getting the sense from your behavior that that's maybe not what you're looking for, then that's okay as well. But please just let me know so that we're not wasting each other's time. You can probably feel even from hearing me say that, that the energy is totally different and it's an energy that is much more likely to garner engagement and respect from someone than the energy of panic and desperation, which I think is where a lot of anxious people go by default. So in addition to that, a couple of other things that you can do if you're on the receiving end of this and you're having a hard time, I think the self-advocacy piece is really key, but other things you can do, try not to become so obsessed with the relationship that you're, it's all you're thinking about and you're just obsessing over it and totally fixated. Again, I think that's where we go by default if we have anxious attachment patterns, but it's the last thing you need. So really make sure that you're planning stuff with friends and taking that opportunity to nourish yourself, nurture yourself, do the things that support you to feel well and good, go to therapy, do whatever you need to do so that you're not like, 100% all eggs in the basket of this person who is pulling away and leaving you feeling really stressed and strung out. That's not going to help the cause. And another thing that you can do rather than making the relationship this really serious place of like, we need to have a talk and it always feeling very heavy, try and intersperse. Like, again, I do think it's important to have the conversations, but try and intersperse it with Connective things that are not serious in nature. That will generally be well received by someone with more avoidant patterns because for them, having to sit down and have like serious emotional conversations is going to be a source of dread more than it is something that they'll look forward to and feel relief from. So doing things that are like quality time, let's like go on a hike together or do a cooking class or something that feels like a fun activity that is lighthearted, that doesn't have to be bogged down with all of the serious emotional stuff. That might be a nice way to feel connected with them and for them to feel connected with you and be reminded of all of the great things about being in a relationship without the the baggage, so to speak, of all of the other stuff that can freak them out for want of a better term. So that is a nice thing to intersperse with the other stuff, which is more directly asking for what you need. Um, Make sure that you're not letting the whole relational field be bogged down with serious, heavy stuff, because as I said, that will almost certainly cement their perception that the relationship is asking too much of them and that will lead to further deactivation. So try and create some balance there and inject some lightness into the relationship rather than having it feel heavy all the time. 
I should also say that I did a previous episode a while ago titled what to do when a partner pulls away or an avoidant partner pulls away. In that episode, I speak more to the dynamics in an established relationship. I realize in this episode, I focus more on kind of early stage relationship. But if you are looking for more on this and you're in an established relationship, a long-term relationship, and your partner is going through periods of pulling away, definitely go check out that other episode because that will speak to that experience and give you some tools and tips for that. So I'm going to stop there because this is getting long, but I hope that's been helpful. As always, so grateful for those of you who leave feedback and reviews, kind words, YouTube comments, a little reminder that these episodes are all on YouTube for anyone who likes to watch there. But otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks, guys.